Shalom Aleichem, and welcome back, Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Brat. So we completed one season on the Sarm of Reb Chaim, 10 episodes, Mir Hashem. Season 2 will be coming back shortly, but we are back to focusing on the new Masechta. We just began the new Masechta in the Daf HaYemi cycle, Masechta Ksubis, and Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Brat would like to share with us some of his incredible insights about the Sfarim on this Masechta. However, before we begin, I would like to mention a sponsor who's sponsoring this episode. He asked to remain anonymous, but I would like to read the following message that he sent us. He says he is donating this shear, sponsoring this shear in honor of Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Brutt. He says, Rabbi Dr. Brutt, all the sessions are fantastic. It provides a great deal of covered atayra and enhances one's limud atayra by providing insight and history about mechabrim and svarim. His sessions on the Svarim of Kanievsky Zatzal in particular are one of the best ways to honor the memory of this great and unique Gadol. I had the opportunity to correspond with Rabbi Dr. Brutt in the past, and I'm appreciative of that. Despite his busy schedule, he's giving up his time and quick to respond. Please continue with these sessions. So I want to mention, actually, Rabbi Eliezer, people have reached out. You know, we didn't do for a couple of weeks. We didn't post anything. They wanted to know what's going on. Where are they? I did tell them that it takes you an enormous amount of time to prepare these shiurim, these lectures. And if anybody wants to reach out and sponsor, perhaps it's an opportunity to do some more of them, do them more often. So if you want to reach out to either myself, M at ou.org or eliezerbrut at gmail.com, it's something we are certainly open to considering. And just one more message that we just got, and the person sent to us, and says, Hi, Team Oldaf. Thank you for putting this series at the center of your app. I watched the first episode and immediately followed with another three episodes. It's like Pringles. Once you pop, you can't stop. Okay, Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Brutt. So what do you have in store for us today? Um, one thing I know we discussed before we got on air is that there's a lot of advertising about Masechus Ksubis, about Shas Katan. If you haven't learned Shas, or didn't have the opportunity to complete Shas, learn Ksubis. You have Shas Katan and Ksubis. So I asked you, is that something which has any source anywhere? Or it's just something cute that was made up. Right. Okay. So we'll begin like this. I'll, I'll say um, as a joke, sort of, I'll say as a joke that Masechtas Ksubis, when people learn it, so it's learned in Yeshiva all over, as well, as well also, and was always learned. But um, even though it was learned, Many times, the parts that people get up to has nothing to do with ksuva. They don't even know what the word ksuva has to do with ksuvas. Now, why is that? Because ksuvas is a, is a mesechta. It's, sha, it's literally shas katan. What does that mean? It means is as you start learning, dafiyami is already in the beginning. It goes all, literally, there's sugyas that relate to kala tarakula that can be found in this mesechta. Now, so where does this thing come from, Shas Katan? How early, how far back can we trace it? So it's not so clear how far back it goes. I do not have the answer how far back it goes, but I could show some earlier sources for it. Number one is that a lot of times it's always interesting to see is a tzava of Adam Gadol that left behind in tzava and then it gets printed. Very, a lot of times it's fascinating information. One such known tzava is Rav Sheftel Horowitz. And Rav Sheftel Horowitz, he is the son of the Shla. So he wrote a tzava. It's printed. It's called Yesh Neichlin. It's first printed in, I think, 1701. There he talks about, he's giving his, he's listing out which Masechtas his children should learn. He says, make sure to learn. Masechtas Shabbos is Chashev. Brachas is Inyan Gadol. Then he says, Masechtas Suvis, Kailu Kal Talmud. And therefore you should learn it. He has a lot of other interesting things and, and ideas of what one should learn. It's good to look at this Chibar Yesh Neichlin. And the Chida already brings this down in his Berke Yosef and Echaz Talmud Torah. Um, and the Chida grad over there brings down another Tzava of Rabbi Yaini Lansdorfer, where he also has interesting things in his Tzava. He does not talk about learning Pesuvus as far as I recall. However, um, this is an early source, 1701. Now, what does one do when one wants to find out what the early sources are? So one source, one method is always use Google. But um, if one doesn't want to go before the times of Google, there were different Yedea Sefer that had incredible Yeda, and they would write articles over the years of their information that they discovered. One such Yid was, his name was Rav Tuvia Preshel. A lot of his material has been recent. He died a few years ago, and his daughter has been working very hard to 
make his stuff available. It's on it's a lot of materials on the internet. And she has put out so far, ever since he died, two, six volumes called Mamari Tuvia. In volume four of Mamari Tuvia, they put out, they printed th- two or three articles that he wrote about this topic, and he traces different sources for the where does this thing come from, Shas Kata. So he shows um, originally. He had a few different svarim, which we'll, I'll, I'll list them in a second. That they that the shar when they're talking about mesechtes ksuvis, they emphasize that the chashivas of mesechtes ksuvis is a chas katan or talmud katan. The earliest source so far that he found was a letter printed in 1699, where someone writes to Rav David Oppenheim, a famous gadol who was, we've mentioned him in the past. He also was a tremendous svarim collector. So some chashiv uh, yid, the son of the Shara Ephraim, was writing from Eretz Yisrael to Rav David Oppenheim. I'm sending you a matana, the Ramban's chedushim, a manuscript of it on Ksuvis, which is Shas Katan. This letter was dated. We have it. It's printed in 1699. So this is probably the earliest. So far, it sounds like from this that it, that it was already known that that's how it was called, but this is the earliest instance that he found. He shows, and this was all done before Eitzar Chachma, before Google, before Hebrew books, he shows that this was found in Sefer Oil Oilam, which is a Hebrew written in 1714 on Ksuvis. The Mechaber writes such a Lashen, <coughs> in the Shar of the Shittim Kubetzis when it was printed on Suvis, and the Ra'a, and the Ritva, well, the Svarim, these were Svarim printed in the 1720s through the 1730s. The Sha'arim, the, the printers, emphasized this Nakuda, so it seems it was a known thing to emphasize. Now, the most mefor, most famous, I would say, um, source is the Hafla, because the Hafla was, is, is the, basically the go-to safer on Masech Suvis, and he writes in his Agdama, um, when he talks about it, he says, he's learning the Masechta, and he says, mm-hmm. So therefore he decided to print his first Hebrew that he was going to write, publish, I guess, or write, was on Masechta Suvis, and then he ends up going, continuing with Kedushin. Now he's, when he says Rishayinim, it doesn't necessarily mean Rishayinim in the time of Rishayinim. It could be it is, I, I don't know. Um, it has not been located if it's in Rishayinim yet. But, as I said, already in the uh, 100 um, his Sefer is printed at the end of the 1700s, um, the exact date of his sefer we'll get to, but I believe it was 17. Oh, sorry, it was 1787. But already, as I said, 1699, we have a source, and then we have in the Tzava, where the son, where the son of the Shla is, is, is stressing such a thing. Okay. Now, just as a ara, and to conclude this, the um, is when one learns um, Suvis, you have to know Shas. That's actually um, a, a very important point. When you learn, when you learn Be'iu in certain Masechtas, you could get away without having to have Yedias in other Masechtas. When one learns, let's say Pesach Pesuach, and you don't have Yedias in Shas, you're looking at these Achreinim and you don't understand them even. So I would say a, a, a cute Nakuda in the Shas Katan is that you have to, it's Shas Katan Mamish, and you have to be learning Shas Katan. You have to be aware of, of Shas. Etc. Okay, but this is uh, just the stam um, a plapel right. Fine. One last nakuda is that the Elif Ksav, um, the Hungarian Rav who died in the Holocaust, a beautiful sefer, he writes a school of Shaduchim is to learn Sechtes Ksuvis. Okay. People always like um, Shagula, so we have to throw that in. Okay. okay one more time. The Elif Ksav. Maybe you will share with us where that is and where we can find that. Because, yeah, people. Like page, it's in volume one of the Elif Sav. I believe it's on page Kuf Yud. <laughs> Especially coming from a Zal Litvak like you, who's a proud, proud person. But uh, I guess if you found it in that type of safer, you can mention it. Um, Correct. I know we've discussed in the past learning different Mesechtes. I know it was relevant for Avelos and things like that. Is there any discussion about Masechta is being learned by younger boys. And on Yavamis, it came up. I'm sure this is a classic Chinuch Shaila. Are there any sources that discuss this? And it's relevant in Ksubis as well. So the answer is yes. I found, interestingly enough, someone in, a, um, I think he lives in Flappish. His name is Yisachar Hafman. He put out a tshuva sefer called Mitshuni Einig. This is how it looks. And he has a whole beautiful simon where he collects a lot of information, simon yud dalad, about learning nashim in yeshivas. And he traces various sources about it. And just to mention, he, he points out that there, there are some chassidic sources that they were, it seems they were nervous to learn certain sugis in nashim, and certain, therefore they didn't even learn certain masechtas at, at, at younger ages. And also he brings svardi makairis, that also svardi yeshivas, some svardi yeshivas did not learn 
um, parts of Ksuvis, they would start from Dafyud Ches, which is Shtaris, and onwards just to keep it away from the boys. Now, um, one thing that will become obvious throughout this whole um, presentation today is that Ksuvis was learned from beginning to end in Yeshivas, from the times of the Rishayinim through the Achrayinim, and we don't really see such a emphasis of not to learn it. Um, just to mention, for example, in 1533, we have a description from Sensino when he talks about the Shasim, that he, the Svarim that he printed. He says he printed 23 Masechtas of Gemaras that were learned in Yeshivas. Okay. Um, now, in Yeshivas in those days, it usually was people not married. Oh, um, another, in a, a safer that we're going to discuss briefly uh, soon, Eitz Hadas Taiv, the printer writes, why is he printing on Ksuvis? Because it has all different things, Shas Katan, which we've already just mentioned. The Gam Yad HaKol Loindim, Af Melam De Tinoikis Ubar Raf. Everyone learns it. So it doesn't, and this is a, um, a safer print in the 1860s. It doesn't sound like such a, there was such a fear of learning Masech um, Tuvis even with young kids. An- another source could be found in a um, in the um, 1630s from Rabdava Lida. He wanted to go print a safer and he wasn't able to print a safer because the printers were very occupied printing other svarim. What were they printing? They were printing the Contrasim Amasechtis Ksuvis. What's the Contrasim Amasechtis Ksuvis? So without getting involved, the Contrasim refers to in the olden days, way, way back in the 1630s at least. They used to learn all over Europe the same Masechta each all in all the different yeshivas. And in the beginning of each Zman, um, the, at the Yerid, there was a fair, and the Gedalim would pick which Masechta would be. And then the publishers, based on that, would publish um, um, Gemaras, so it should be available for all the Talmidim. So they used to print Contrasim, so like sort of like paperbacks, so it would be less expensive. It's, it was pretty expensive in those days. And so this is a, a fascinating topic which Yitzhak Yudolov uh, elaborates about. So he talks about this. Dovid Lida went to go print, which is similar today. Sometimes people go print farm, want to go print the safer during the busy season. So he went in the busy season. He couldn't. It was held up. Why? Because of contrasting, he says, of Masechtas Ksuvis. So we see Ksuvis was being learned all over Europe on a mass scale, and there, there could be many other proofs. This. Just to be Messiah in this Nakuda, I would mention that I quoted in the past that there's a Mayurdik and a Tziv and then the Tziv basically says that if it's a Taira, we're supposed to learn it and we're supposed to discuss it with the Talmidim. We're not supposed to be, he was talking specifically about Inyanim of Ziva, of the Keri. Even though they, these things trigger the Machshava, the Nativ says you're supposed to learn it, um, and that's why the Torah goes out of its way to talk about it by Richos, and you're supposed to give it over a Rav to the Talmud, but, um, um, and there's nothing to worry about because we're talking about Inyanim of Taira, and... Um, and therefore, there's nothing to be scared about. And, and Lamaisa, this Rav Hafen brings down some other sources that say Lamaisa, it's Tyra. There's nothing to, to not, there's nothing to be scared about. And one could learn it even if it's with Bachrim. It's interesting is that I was looking about if, if we have the Natsiv Shiurim on um, on Yavam, on Ksuvis, and we, we we literally I don't have it's a mystery to me. We have let's say three four pages, but I know that he that Valajan learned Masech Ksuvis. But I found it very interesting that there's only a few pages. Um, in his Chibur, which is some of the Shiram that they publish of us. Anyway, Akan, these are some of the uh, more Zaitik and Yanim relating to the Masechta of Ksubis. Okay, let's get, let us get down to the meat and potatoes. The Nusach HaGemara, Mishaynim, Achreinim, Rashi, Tosis. Okay, so where do you want to begin? Okay, so I'm going to just mention briefly, when we talk about the Nusach of the Gemara, so I always mention, so in in, in a lot of, in certain Siddharam of Shast, we have the Dukduke Seifrim, but he, um, maybe one day we'll talk about him more by Richos, but he, Nashim, he, he died before working on Nashim. Nashim was a project that was worked on for many, many years. I believe it's completed now by Mechon Talmud Israeli, and in here you could buy two, three volumes of all the of the of Masechta Ksuvis, which is based on all the manuscripts to show all the different manuscript gersais of the Masechta. Some people like it. When you use your art school Gemara, a lot of times when they're when they're referring to a, a Shini Nusach, when they mention in Ha'ara or Izbahadra, I think also does there. This is what they're using. Um, they're not necessarily going back to check up all the different manuscripts. Today there are more. Um, there are other methods, but that's not for now. Just to mention in the um, just I'll, I'll um. As I always like to point out, just recently, literally, um, I think it actually came out today available for purchase, 
is a, a great um, expert on Ga'inim, a world expert on Ga'inim. His name is Yuch, Yuch, Professor Yerachmiel Brody, known as Robert Brody. He wrote, uh, he's the expert on Ga'inim, and he worked for many, many years on Masechta Suvis. A running parish of his just came out on the whole Masechta. He has also written some other books about Masechta Suvis, which deals with a lot of different interesting questions that some people like to know about, but um, just to throw it out there. Okay, but now moving on right away to the, um, to the meat and potatoes, as you called it. I think this Professor Robert Brody actually was interviewed by Nachi Weinstein on his Farm Chatter podcast. He was, yes, he was about Ga'inim. Yeah. Okay, so now um, we, o- we first we always talk about Rashi. So Rashi, um, Suvis, as far as I know, is, is no one ever questioned it's Rashi. But there's something interesting. We have the Shitun Kubetzas, and the Shitun Kubetzas always quotes Rashi Madura Kama throughout this Masechta. So people want to know what is it? Is it uh, now? If the, the discussion about Rashi and the various Maduras is a, is a big discussion, we're not going to go into it right now. But um, Professor Yaakov Nochem Epstein put out many years ago a whole study showing that the, the um, proving, based on manuscripts also, that the the Pirish, that what the um, Shittim Gabetis calls Pirish Rashi Madura Kama is really the Rivan. Who is that? The son in law of Rashi, one of his great Talmudim. And he, he published it. And not only that, just to show that it, that this, um, I have seen some people say that if the Shittim Gretzis calls it Rashi Madura Kama, how could this Epstein say this? But anyway, without getting into that, in a very from from Kaivitz that came out in the, um, I think it was 1999, the first time, and it came out ever since then many times, called Ayul Avram, I'll mention it more shortly. So they printed, and they give him credit um, that, it's the, that the Rivan they got from this Yaakov Nochem Epstein, and one could access it easily. This Oil of Ram is on um, Eitzar Chachma, and it's very important to have already someone from the base Medrash of Rashi. There's supposed to be a lot of Chedushim one could find, and some of this material was never printed before, and this Epstein had discovered it in a manuscript. Okay, that is with Rashi. <coughs> what about Taisus? So Taisvis, normally, we're able to go through very, very brief, very quickly. This Taisvis, everyone knows, certain Masechtas have a Taisvis Rosh, certain Masechtas even have a Taisvis Shan, some Masechtas have a Taisvis Rabbeinu Peretz, okay. So first of all, Masechtas Ksuvis is Zaycha, has numerous Balei Taisvis. Now, what's that significant? We already mentioned, it's Shas Katan, so everything, every extra Taisvis, every extra, ra- like if you learn a Taisvis and you open up a Taisvis Shan, so your head spins already because of the amount of material, how many Gemaras are being thrown at you. If one wants to learn Taisvis properly, only our generation was Zaycha to have with all these new discoveries to, with all the different texts that there are, it's mind-boggling. There's a Taisis Rush, okay, Taisis Shans, yeah. There's a Taisis Ria Lovan that was printed in 1954. There's a fellow Aaron Gabay, which I'll talk about in a minute. He put out a Taisis Garnish. And there's more um, about Taisis. One, he print this Aaron Gabay, who's written a lot, I've quoted him in other uh, such presentations. In Satis Ksuvis, he's published numerous manuscripts relating to the Ballet Taisis. And he has a whole beautiful article, which is available. For, I could send it out free um, P- in PDF if someone asks at eliezerbrock at gmail.com in Yerushasenu volume 10, where he goes through literally all the tesis that are available. He discusses what the chiddush of each one is, what's so significant. Even at the end of the piece, he gives a sample. What's the chashivas of having so many things just to make your head spin is, is not is not a good enough reason. But he shows unbelievable in helping one understand Tysis. What and just to be messiah in this prat is in recent up till recently, if someone wanted to know about any question that they had about Tysis, they would pull out a safer, even um, um, from people would pull out some admitted it, some didn't, from Ephraim Orbach called Balia Tysis, printed in at least eight editions. And this was the classic work for the past bunch of years on the Balia Tysis. In recent years, based on new materials that we're able to that we have, so this fellow Aaron Gabai, another fellow Ariel Aronov. Yid, um, another person, Ari, Ari Leibowitz, have done incredible work in, in getting us further with understanding Taisis, discovering new manuscripts and in and, and, and depth. One Masechta, one could see this, if you, want, if you want your head to spin, is just not just to learn the Taisvis, it's open up this, as a guide and piece, take this piece from Gabai, track down some of the stuff is online, and you can see what's going on out there with Taisis, and you'll have a, a great time. Okay, that's with Tysus. Okay, now we go on to Rishonim. So Rishonim, I'm going to break it down in two ways. I'm going to talk about is first the development of the printing of Rishonim. We did not have, um, contrary to what people 
people don't realize we didn't uh, i think i already emphasized this a few times in different presentations we showed them were not so accessible we didn't have it in the 1700s is the first time pretty much we showed them really become available on any level starting with in 1722 a raw comes available it was in the library of Reb shmuel oppenheim this was the um, un- the rich uncle of Reb david oppenheim who we've discussed in the past with a crazy Svarim library and he also, it seemed, had a, some rare manuscripts, and this is printed from his library. The Ritz was printed in 1729. Um, this is from the Mishpacha, the Shla. It seems the Shla had this in manuscript and used it in a Shiurim, even. And then you have the Shittim Kabetzis, his first printed in 1738. This alone was a monumental discovery and helped um, for the, from 1738 and onwards, because the Shittim Kabetzis, anyone who's familiar with, is a, is a collection of many of the Rishayim. And that's how people, if you had a Shittim Kabetzis, until recent years even, and you learned Ksuvah's Rishim Kabetzis, you were pretty good, because he had in there the, Ram, the Ramban, the Ritz, the Rajba, and many other pieces of Rishayim. Okay. The Ma'is of the Ramban is printed the first time in 1765. For some reason, we're not sure how this happened, but right away it gets reprinted under the name the Rajba. And different people realize that it's a mistake. It's not the Rajba, it's the, it's the Ramban, such as the Radal. He writes a Lashon anyone, um, when he quotes a certain piece. Anyone who's, he says, anyone who's familiar with Haragal, the Lashon, Ramban, the Rajba, you'll understand right away this is the Ramban. He says, if you look in the Shintu Mubetzas and Ksuvis, you'll see whatever he brings from the Ramban is in this is in this work called the Rajba. So it's somehow, right after it was printed in 1765, it was printed a few more times, it got it got misattributed. It's not the only time that something from the Ramba, Ramban and Rajba gets mixed around. Okay. Anyway, We'll return to this shortly. Okay, Ad Khan, these were the four Rishayim, but I um um, um that were out there, in the, but they only come to light in the 1700s, pretty much. Okay, now, okay, now we could go further. Um, the next step, which is Achrayim. So Achrayim, Baruch Hashem, as Ksuvis is just this so much. Um, um I'm just going to list a few different things and, and when they were available, and, and and then we'll move on. Number one, there was the Ranach. Ranach. Dies in 1610. He, he chooses Ranach. He has a Hebrew on, on Masech of Suvis. It's printed, in, I said, in 1610, right when he dies. And that's one of the early Achreinim that one could find on the Masech. Okay. Uh, one, another early Sefer, Del Yerabba. Del Yerabba dies in 1712. And he wrote a Hebrew on Suvis and some other Masech. But it's printed by his grandson in, the seven, in 1768. Now, El Yerabba, everyone knows, everyone's familiar when you learn halacha, he's an extremely important chibor. Um, Chai Adam is very into him, Rabbi Fraim Zalmar Golis, and, and the list is endless. I have a friend, or Tzvi Ler, he wrote a whole art, a beautiful article all about El Yerabba. It's printed in Yishurim, volume 35, and one could see how he was so, um, how the island was very machsh of him throughout the diaries. He was a Rosh Hashiva at the time. He was a Talmud Muvah grada of the Magan Avram. He had a beautiful Svarim library, and there's a lot to talk about him, but um, not for now. I'll call upon him, his, he has a Hebrew on a, a nice amount of, of Ksuvis. It's available on Hebrew books. Another Hebrew that comes out 1714 is from a Kiva Laren. It's called Ha'ayol Oilam. As I mentioned, he also says in Sagdama, he, he mentions that he's writing about Chas Katum. Okay. Now, Obviously, um, there are other achreinim. I can't trace every single sefer that's out there, but I'm just going to list a few. But the, I would say one of the big turning point in the oilam of, of achreinim that had an impact till our generation is the Pnei Yeshua. The Pnei Yeshua is... is the Pnei Yeshua is 1739, and he, later on he puts out a, a surface of a conscious achreinim. So the previous few that you mentioned aren't ones that are probably familiar to many of the people who went through the yeshiva system. What type of sparm are they, and why do you pick out those specifically? So uh, even though I'm going to list even a few more, I cannot never, I, I was in yeshiva, I learned at least three times in yeshiva ksuvis, and I'm uh, to be honest, I do not think any, most of the achreinim that I'm about to list, I don't think I ever heard them quoted, I don't even know, most of them, I don't think they were around, this is pre-Hebrew books days, or it's a Chachma days, so they were, they were never used. Um, why is a good question? It, it, it actually would have to do with what the Mahal Halima as the Mahal Halima changed, um, and um, and it seems that what we what we appreciate more, which I'm not going to get into, is a whole new Mahal Halima which shifted towards, I guess, in the 1880s and onwards, and then at, until the yeshiva world before World War II, and then after World War II, and this was a shift from. Uh, moving away from many of these types of svarim, so much so that today, I think a lot of people from if you have if you shiva, if you would bring these in, they would they wouldn't be able to understand it because they're not even familiar a lot with the terminology and the types of questions that they're asking. 
Um, but it, it's actually a, um, a question to Negev for all the Yeshiva Shemusachtas to see the progress of the Achreinim and what changed, what caused it to change. It's it's a it's Arichas Dvarim, but we will not, we'll have mercy today. Maybe it could be its own episode or two, sourcing yeah. and seeing how the Limudim as form that were used in the Yeshivas throughout the ages. That'd be a very interesting topic. Correct. It's definitely a very interesting topic. Uh, I, yeah, definitely interesting topic. Anyway, but, but what I would say is, and I'm going to return to listing some more Achroin in the Taka are not heard of, but first I'm going a little chronologically, is the Pnei Yeshua in 1739, that actually does have impact till today, which it's his own schmooze also, it needs to be discussed by Richos. But Bekitzer, one thing that we find out is that, the, I mentioned earlier, the Ritva is printed from manuscript in 1729. The Pnei Yeshua is aware of the Ritva, and, and he uses it a lot. Now, this gets involved with the, the Chiddush of the Pnei Yeshua. Why, why actually, relating to your question, why it remained that he's the safer that's still on the table, so to speak, at least in some places. This gets into um, interesting material of Yisrael Tashma and recently a, a beautiful work, which was printed in the Kaivetz Chitzig that comes out from Lakewood um, um, on the Pnei Yeshua from a fellow Yeshua Meyerson. He wrote it as a master's, but it's printed in this Kaivetz Chitzig uh, Yes, in Lakewood. There's obviously some, we pointed this out in a different episode. There's a lot happening today that's not happening in, um, that hasn't happened, that didn't used, it would not have happened in previous years. Anyway, so this sefer does remain, I would say, um, um, accepted. But if we go on, there's a there's a sefer chedushe rashbats, and the reason why it's called chedushe rashbats, it's not of the rishon. It's printed in I think 1779 from Rav Simcha Bunim Rappaport. In an addition, in a recent reprint of it, there's a there's a very useful article from Ritzal Landau about it. I believe that's on Hebrew books. Um, okay, now. There's a sefer that comes out in 1788 from Rabbi Yaman Lichtenstadt. So this sefer, I found a draft interesting. I'll just talk about it for literally a minute. So this sefer, what's significant about sefer? He's a Talmud Muvuk by none other than the Neidib Yehuda. First in the Shar of the sefer, he thanks his Shver for making available to him a lot of svar, for spending money and making available for him hard to get Svarim. I found that interesting. He also thanks on the Shar of the sefer, his wife, Fredel. Okay, so this is a question I've been asked recently um, a few times, and I, uh, um, people asked when did be, w- when do mechabrim thank their wives publicly with the name? And here uh, now I did not trace it at all. I just was asked about it, to, um, but here is a, a source where the mechaber in the shah. It's not only in the hagdama buried at the end. You'll say no one reads hagdama here. He puts it in the shah. Okay, and I just saw this recently. Yeah, he has a beautiful haskama from the Nain Yehuda. He says that I know that he was zaycha to learn Ba'im Kalacha, and he knows this Masechta very well. And then he writes out in Zagdama um, um, that he, it, seen, it sounds like he was a ganz fine Tamil Chacham before he got to the Nain Yehuda. He learned by the other G'daylam in Prague. And anyway, he, he learned this, he puts out a Masechta Suvis. What's he using? The Marshal, the Marshal, Muram Lublin. And then he says, but of course, the Sefer Pnei Yeshua, Iyanti, Kiroiv, of uh, al um, this is we see already in a short period of time, the 1788, how the Pnei is already Mamish, one of the main Svarim already. Okay. Moving on, there's a Sefer Chachma printed in 1790, who's a Talmud of Rabbi and Eipschitz, as he emphasizes in the Shar of his Sefer. It's also a Lachadik, and um, it comes out, it's also available. Again, today I never really came, I, I, it might have actually been reprinted in the past uh, 40 years, but I never really saw, saw or heard it used. Another Sefer, this, the Mechaber actually was famous, but again, his Sefer, I would say, is not also too much used. Ayala Sahavim from Rabbi Aryeh Tumim. He was the Rav of Bride. He died at the age of 104 in 1831. Incredible. Um, he wrote his Chuvah Sefer, Gur Ari Yehuda. Um, to, if one wants to learn about this interesting person who was a Rav of Bride, a tremendous Tamil Chacham, um, a friend of mine, Ben Yo Kain, wrote an article in Yeshurin Lamed Tess all about him. He does not deal with this Chibur of his, but he deals with the Gerari Yehuda, a very interesting Chibur, and, and other information about him. Okay. Now there's another Sefer, Eitz Hadas. This is the Mechaber was active. He dies in 1785. His, his grandkids printed in 1863, much later on. And here also I mentioned earlier that they referred to about Shas Kaptum. Okay. Um, and these are some of the various Achroinim, I would say, that are out there. Okay. Now, but we're, besides the um, Pnei Yeshua, are there any other Achreinim that become like the go-to Achreinim that Arayim, they are um, looked at on some level? The answer is there are two very, very important Achreinim, and that is the Hafla, 
Aflo dies in 18, 1805. In 1787, writes a Sefer. Aflo sometimes it's called the Sefer Aksuva. I believe when Rafan Zalmagolis refers to it all the time, he calls it Sefer Aksuva. You could see right away the tremendous simcha, I think, of, let's say, Rafan Zalman. Others, when it came out, it was a Mapecha. He was one of the Gedoli Hadar Mamish and that Kufa. Hasidim like it because they call him a Hasid, which is its own discussion. But um, the Kitzer, this Sefer, is a Sefer that is incredible. Adayoyim, I think it's accepted in a lot of circles to use. Um, it has an incredible long Hagdama, which is Kedai to read, not out Mosech Ksuvis. And anyway, another aspect of this Sefer is there's a Dagesh and Halacha. There's a whole section in the back of the Sefer, Hilchus Ksuva Halacha Lamaisa. So this is one such Sefer that becomes a classic, Adayoyim. He also mentions, I mentioned about Shas Katimfar. Another Sefer that becomes a classic and remains a classic till today, although it's not as intense on the Masechta as the Aflod. Aflod Mamash is tons of pieces on every blot, but this Sefer also carries you through the Masechta, not only through the few um, Yeshivish um, Sugyas or Prakim, is the base Yaakov from the Nasivis. He dies in the in 1832, his Sefer is printed in 1822, and Alayoyim, it's also one of the most accepted Achreinim that people are willing to look at. Now, even though it's, we have a different uh, jargon of, of learning. Ruby Kivager is a different type of safer. That's not one of these two. I'm about to get up to Ruby Kivager. Your mamish took the words out of my mouth. And so if you also the, you can I, discuss if these far mentioned the Pnei Shu, I believe the Kivager certainly does, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 Afla, the Afla, I don't remember. Um, uh, but what's interesting is, when you're looking through all these svarim, you could see there's an intensity into the marsha, which we've discussed earlier in the episode of Rechaim Kanievsky. Throughout all these svarim, marsha is mamash used, the afla, the base Yaakov even. But another nakudu with the base Yaakov, before we get to Rikki Feger, is that the he's also concerned about halacha, and there's a whole chibur in the back on Shulchan Aruch Hilchus Ksuva, also very important for Paiskim. So we have here, not only that the G'dayli Adar, the famous, the ones that they, their names are still known today in the, the Beis Marish, Ayyum Halacha, the Ayyum of Learning, the Aflan, the Beis Yaakov, they also write Halachadik parts to their Chiburim in the back, which is interesting to see that they were, it just was, it was also, there was an Akuda of Learning, Alib the Hilchasa. Okay. Now, of course, at the same time as the Nasivis, his good friend was Rabbi Kivager. Rabbi Kivager is, is Mishunadik on, 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 in Masech Tzuvis Befrat, and today it's just endless how much material there is on Masech Tzuvis. I still remember when it first came out the fancy two volumes from Rabbi Rieli on Masech It's endless. It's 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 it's, it's a pella how much material there is. There's a joke. One of the gedolim that have been writing from his uh, their graves Al Hayoyim is Rabbi Kivager and the Chassam Seifer. So and when one picks up that Tzuvis, the Rabbi Kivager, you like. Where did this even come from? Anyway, so those are um, three. Uh, I would say those are the Rebbe Kiveger, Beis Yaakov, and Afla. And earlier I mentioned the Pnei Yishu. Now, there's one last achron to mention, and that is the Yamshel Shleima. Why am I mentioning the Yamshel Shleima now? The Yamshel Shleima dies in 1574. So, without getting into the whole story of the writings of the, of the Yamshel Shleima and if he had an impact or not on the world of Halacha, although he's of course, uh, the, the Ben Deir of the Ramah, and one of the Gedoyle Hadar through the Deiris, but the Shiloh is if his Svarim had an impact. One of the Nukudas is his Svarim did not necessarily have such impact, and why not? That's a, um, a question, and if it really did or didn't. But, Mesechtas Ksuvis is first time printed from manuscript only in 1862 on the first four prakim. Here again, the the printer emphasizes Mesechtas Ksuvis, he throws in the Shas Katan aspect, he throws in Rabbi Yaakov Emden, who gave a skama to the Yam Shashleim, which was printed in 1740, which is also quite a long time after the, Mar- the Yam Shashleim dies, because I said he dies in 1574. But basically, Rabbi Yaakov Emden also says, maybe it would be Zaycha to have the one on Ksuvis. And we see it takes over 100 years to get the manuscript on Ksuvis out. Who gives it a beautiful skama, Rabbi Yitzchel Khan Inspector, and the Shailu Meishiv. The Shailu Meishiv says... Again, it's Merdik to have the Chibur of Yam Shashleima on Shas Katan. Al Kopanim, these are some of the famous um, Achreinim that are out there. Um, in, and, and today we have Hebrew books, we have Eitzah Chachma, and one could get them very easily for free. Okay. Now, I, I would like to just now. Okay, so that, that's part um, with Achreinim. Now, I want to make an Akud over here, which I don't always do. I like to do it in a chronological 
way. That's why I'm cho- choosing like this. Up till now, I said that Sachs Suvers, you see, there's a wealth of Akronim, and uh, now Rosh Hashiva Svarim, there's a credible wealth of them. I'm not even bothering to think about talking about them. There's dozens out there, Baruch Hashem, and other people. Just to mention, I've quoted already a few times, is this Ayul Avram. It's printed in the 19, uh, 1999, I think, was the first time. It's printed four or five times already. Each time it has some Rishayim. Now, to re- first, this Ayul Avram has a Chibur called Chiti Yashana. Who is this? Again, this Aaron Gabe that I discussed, he talks, he has a whole theory who it is. And even though this Kaivitz printed on most Aksuvis, he found a manuscript of some other Prakim, which again is um he, he publishes of the Shiti Yashana. It seems to have to um helpful for Tysis again. Now, we mentioned that the Ramban is printed, and then sadly it gets misattributed to the Rajba. What is the is there a Rajba on Ksuvis? Interestingly enough, there is. It's first discovered, I believe it's in Tufshin Lama Gimel, when Rav Herschel prints it. And later on, now he prints it without too many Ha'aris. Recently, Meisr Cook, I think it was in Tufshin Ayin, Meisr Cook released it with Ha'aris on the whole Masechta. So therefore, if someone has the Herschel edition, it's Kedai to get the Meisr Cook if you like Ha'aris. Anyway, this is based on manuscripts. So finally, now, in our generation, we have the Rajba. And the Ramban. Now, the Ramban, I mentioned earlier, the Ramban. So, there's incredible work done by Ezra Shvat. It's a, his work on the Ramban on Suvis is available on Hebrew books. Okay. Now, so so far we have I'm mentioning is that we have the Ramban, with, which is which which they did not have to, even though it was printed earlier on. That I mentioned it was first printed and it was printed a few times. It was bechlal not complete. It was full of mistakes. Only our generation we zayich the Ramban. The Raj were the first time it's being printed is in the 1970s and then and, and based either a better edition, but basically 1970s. The Ritva, although it's printed early on, it's full of full of mistakes throughout the generations. Again, here Moisir Cook puts it out. Another reason put out is Shita Leharan. It's first printed in 1976, but later on it's done, it's redone. It's not It's not clear if it's the Ran, or, but if it's someone that has to do with the Ran. Again, another significant reason. Just to mention another reason, Rabbeinu Kreskris. It's first printed, I believe, in 1983. Another reason is a Hebrew from a Talmud of the Rush, put out by this Ezra Shvat. He, he has made available his work on Yitzhar Chachma. And to conclude with two more Rishayim, there's the Ra'ah, which I also mentioned was printed way back. But it was done again, up in manuscripts with many more pieces. And to conclude with the last is Nuki Yosef. At the same time, whoever put out the Ra'ah, he also put out the Nuki Yosef. What, what am I trying to bring out of here is, sometimes a generation of Zeicha, people don't even realize this. Some of the Rishayim were available they weren't so much used, but our generation, literally now even, stuff has been discovered in the past 10 years that one has available through different, you go to a farm store for some of them, or, or different search engines, or Barilan has some of these texts. You can learn and learn the Rishayim in a, in a, with, on, the, on this amazing Masechta, Masechta Subis that has not been learned before. Now, that's with um, Rishayim. Just to throw out, it's not fear. We have to mention some Akron that's been discovered. So yes, to, uh, just to mention one, besides the Oil of Ram that I've been constantly quoting, that they printed different Shiurim and materials of Akronim that wasn't available or, or from manuscript, is a Chibur from the Baal Medjur Shmuel. The Medjur Shmuel was a Talmud of the Arizal. So again, Medjur Shmuel is very famous. He's the go-to say from Masechtas Avas. But do we have anything else from him? Answer is again in recent years, there's been a safer of his of his drushes, his 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 tyran chumish, and now a mechon shubinavshi a few years ago put out, uh, I think a forty blad or so on masechtas ksuvus. So this is someone that's a talmud of he's a, he's a real talmud of darizal. So much so, just to quote it, it's because it's a very important thing. He talks, he gave an incredible hesped on Darizal. It was printed for, first for a manuscript by Mordechai Fachter, more recently, it was printed again. And in this manuscript, you see in, in this drusha where he talks about Darizal, he refers to him as someone who was Isaac in Mishnah, Talmud, Safra, Visifre, which is an incredible thing. People would ask him questions and all different things, and he knew how to answer. And he says, it means that we see him also in a nigla de cassettes. What's significant is, it's because I mentioned what's one of the go to svarim in the Masechta, which they did have through the generations already from the 1730s, the Shitim Kubetzis, who was one of the Chavrusas um, and very close relationship with the Shitim Kubetzis, in nigla. But this is its own discussion to the, uh, for now, for now. Okay, I can These are just some of the Rishonim Achronim out there. I'm, I'm apologizing. I'm not talking about the Rosh Hashivas now. Just to conclude with one, just some um, um, side. Uh, um, in, I guess in Hebrew it's Jakav. I don't know how to translate it exact, unique, uh, whatever into English. Someone will, uh, will definitely correct me. Is as follows. One is 
that um, Masechta Suvas talks about the Ksuva. So yes, there are, of course, like every other area, Hilchas Ksuva, a bunch of them. There's been illustrate people see it today, but when did this come? There's something called illustrated suvis. So this is also a fascinating discussion. There's a fellow Sabar who wrote a whole doctorate about it. And in JTS they have a massive collection of suvis that are illustrated, ready for hundreds of years. So they're finally putting out two massive I don't have it, but they're about to put out in a, literally in a month. I think if you pre-order it it's cheaper. Um a bunch of the pictures, and you can learn a lot of interesting things from these pictures in these ksuvas. The whole collection is two massive fancy volumes. It's supposed to come out within a month. Now, that's one interesting thing. Another interesting thing is that in the Kairagniza they discovered from, from Eretz Yisrael ksuvas, which sh- shows we have, we're learning Bavli. So there's also what what, what was, so this, this the, the Martha Akiva Freeman wrote two massive volumes called Jewish Marriage in Palestine. This is based on the Kairagniza. It's called the Ksuva Traditions Here's one volume, and there's another volume of it. Also, interesting uh, stama yudia ba'alma to know about. And and um, to conclude with one last thing, again, just also because of its uniqueness, is is there's a tshuva that was printed in 1859. It's called Tshuva Binyan Kriya Saksuva Bein Birchas Eirisin L'Birchas Nesuin. This is how it looks. It's a, I'm pretty sure it's available on Hebrew books. And it says the author was Rav Nechemya from Wien. Anyway, but the reason why you'll hear why I'm mentioning it in a second, obviously it's a personal angle. I have a good I have a good friend that he was sadly nifter. Um, his name was Dr. Shlomish Brecher. So anyway, the point was is that he came across this small little Hebrew, this chuva, and the chuva deals with why um, the the laning of the what, let's try in the minig this minig of the Kriya Saksuva. It's a small chuva. It's about um, fifteen pages. He bought it, an original of it, and he was very curious. He couldn't find who's this Reb Nechemia. It says he's the Av Bezdin in the city in Nichols in Bialystok. Strange. We know about Bialystok in those years. He couldn't find it anyway. He spent time looking and he couldn't find. And then he, he sent. Eventually, he sent that I should go ask. He was told that this Yid Reb Shmuel Ashkenazi he's going to be able to solve this mystery, and he tackle came up with an idea. Based on his idea, Sprecher was able to write a whole, figured out more behind this, and who was the real author of this Hebrew. It, goes, it was on auction even a few weeks ago, and they didn't realize what it, what this is. This is not a real tshuva. There never was a person from the Chemia Rav of Bialystok. It's written by someone else, Meir Ishalim. And one could read this whole story. This, was, this, was, um, this came out a bunch of years ago on this farm blog. Um, Dr. Sprecher wrote it up while he was alive. And it's interesting, Jakava Sefer, related to Tshuva, we're talking about Ksuvas, Marech and Vegan Ksuvas, as they say, so I had to throw it in um, um, just to mention some weird, whacked out thing to conclude with. Okay, I can on Masechtas Ksuvas. Okay, so we have homework. Whoever knows how to say the word Jakava in English, please let us know, if you're still listening. And again, any questions, comments, suggestions, eliezerbrotagmail.com, shwaitm at ou.org. Again, Sponsorships available, perhaps opportunities to talk about other topics. And we're looking forward to seeing you again soon. Have a wonderful day.